time certain for adjournment of unit three um, because I have to yeah. make the, uh, an office at UVM by four. Um, but with that said, um, I wanted to hear from principal superintendents and NEA on the waiting study. And then Jim, I believe, has a new draft for us on the statewide health care. So, Jay. Okay, for the record, Jay Nichols, Vermont Principals Association, Executive Director. Um, you've got your te my testimony online and in front of you. So, <clears throat> just a few comments that I'll make on this and answer any questions that you might have for me. First of all, um, please consider this initial testimony as you go through and make changes. I'd obviously be interested in having the opportunity to weigh in on those. As you my, my best piece of advice is the same advice that I used to give my uh, shortstops and second baseman when I was teaching college baseball, high school baseball. So be quick, don't hurry, try and turn a double play. Same thing here, there's a moral imperative here, there's something that needs to be done, obviously we know that, but take your time to do it right. It'd be the best advice that I could give you is in terms of trying to come up with a bill and get to the waiting study. Uh, if you believe the validity of the points made in the study, which, which I do, especially around poverty, I think those of us that have been in public education for Vermont for a long time could say that we've seen the effects of poverty uh, and the, the waiting that we've had consistently in the past doesn't make sense. I don't know where it came from. I share in here that uh, I believe the current waiting process is outdated and I know of no research data that supports the formulation of current waits. And actually we had a podcast yesterday or the day before we had Paul Stilo from Public Assets uh, on our EPA podcast and Mike asked them, Mike Everett asked him the question about the funding formula, and, and he was saying that when they passed Act 60, those weights were already in effect, but they just basically yep. carried them over from the foundation formula. So it's obviously it's been a long time. Nobody seems to know what the empirical research is behind that, if there ever was any. Uh, also, and I'm just hitting on some of the major, major issues in the report. I've, uh, as some of you know, I've been critical of small schools grants for quite a while. I think that the small schools grants um, sometimes were given to schools that were not geographically isolated. I can think of a case where I hired a principal uh, in a town and his school was half full and a town literally five minutes away on the same main road was half full. And the resources that were being used there in both schools were getting support. And I know that we've tightened that up some in the last few years. This report talks about getting rid of the small schools grant and using the pupil waiting formula. I think that's a better way to go. Uh, the report also mentions just briefly the concept of the categorical, categorical funding for um, trauma and mental health needs for students uh, for better support for students with trauma. So schools, and I actually talked to Corey about this yesterday, continue to serve as a branch of mental health. I mean, much of what is happening in schools are things that happen in many other states through social services and schools are picking up a lot of that. And I'm not saying they shouldn't. Sometimes and maybe the system, the rurality of our state. However, there's a cost that comes with that. And so when we spend time, energy, and resources on things that are not instructional in nature, that does take away from the instructional time that we have. And it adds further burden to property taxpayers and school budgets. Do I have a solution on where the money would come from? No, but I think it's something that needs to be considered. The EPA has met with the governor's office. We've talked to them about it. We have another meeting with Sarah Squirrel just to talk about the, the, the huge influx of students in trauma that are in schools that are, are being worked with. And until you get a kid regulated, you can't instruct them. I was talking to a principal today uh, who was telling me that a student her, her school has, every day comes in, flips over desks, you know, all kinds of stuff like it's happening all day. The kid's five years old in kindergarten. And the school is trying to keep the kid in school and work with the kid. They haven't kicked him out, they haven't suspended him, they've shortened his day, they've tried lots of different things, and they're still really, really struggling. And the biggest problem they have is when he goes home going home into an environment that's probably not mm -hmm. conducive to being a supportive environment. Uh, we also believe that early childhood students should be counted in proportion to the amount of time they spend in the school. Uh, I strongly advocated for preschool for a long time. I think full day preschool programs, the research is pretty clear. Uh, it's actually kind of embarrassing to me that North Carolina has every four year old in preschool and, and we in Vermont and consider ourselves a progressive uh, state mm -hmm. don't have that uh, option for, for kids. Uh, if we had a full day ADM allowability so the school district could make the decision themselves and you'd fund it at whatever level they did it just like you do kindergarten and I think that would be an incentive for school systems to try to have full day programs and I think there's a lot of research that supports that. Dr. Colby talks about that a little bit in her study. 
Um, and then the last point related to that is, like other interviews in the waiting study, other people that are interviewed, I do worry about districts that may see the ability to relieve taxpayer burden where really we would hope that they would spend the money creating more opportunities for students. I worry about some of my older communities where I was a, where I was a superintendent. You know, I was pretty fiscally conservative and we tried to save money where we could. I can see some of those places saying, you know what, we really don't have these programs, but our taxpayers would much rather have us do this. Let me anticipate yeah. Senator Perrin's question. Um, can you, registering the concern, um, what would your thought be on any kind of, um, you know, statutory restrictions on the ability to use right. that tax capacity? Right. So I've thought about that a little bit, and I, I can't come up with a good answer. I mean, I think it's something that, you know, maybe it's Corey and I should have a conversation about, but it's something that we, I think we should think about. Whether or not there's a statutory fix to that or not, I, I don't know. But I think if there isn't, what's going to happen is you're going to have the same inequalization that we're already doing. Act 60 equalized the pain it costs everybody to raise a dollar. You know, so that gave us one of the fairest funding systems in the nation, and Act 60 made it even better. But on the opportunity side, we still have huge disparity. Yeah, and and you know inherent in local control that We're local decisions control are going to be made as close to the local level as possible. Right. Um, so let me go back if I could quickly to you mentioned the possibility of a categorical grant for um, trauma or themed around trauma, mm -hmm. and you said you couldn't think of a, a source for the funding. I I don't worry as much about that as I worry about. How would one uh, put in for the funds? What what would be the um, because it, it seems to me that in order to do that you'd have to essentially create a, a kind of register of students who are exhibiting these behaviors who have experienced <coughs> trauma um, cases in their right. past. Right. Uh, so there was as the waiting study was being done there was some modest support here and there that I would hear for having ACEs itself be a weighted category. Right. And I just, I, I've thought and thought about it. I can't understand how a school district would do that um, in the way that we do with free and reduced lunch. Hey, see, I, I don't see it that way. I wasn't thinking that way at all. Okay. I, I was thinking more of, and I, I was thinking more of how do we provide the training necessary for the teachers okay. and support staff in the system so that they're really trauma-informed, not even more than trauma-informed, trauma experts so that they can really meet kids at their need. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there may all be, a, always may be a small subsection of kids that are gonna need a lot of extra support outside of the, school, but if we're getting to the point where there's two or three kids in every class, the teachers, every teacher's really struggling to handle, and that's what we're hearing from the field, how do we get, how do we get to the front of that? How do we prevent, be preventive on that to give the teachers the tools that they need we're asking 22-year-old kids to come out of college with very little training on this, putting them in front of a classroom of students and seeing behaviors that they never anticipated they would see. No, fair enough. Professional development in terms of proficiency-based learning, too. Right. So in almost all of these... Um, Professional uh, learning is a theme. Yeah. Yeah. A theme. Um, a couple other thoughts. Student economic disadvantage. So I, I basically just took the five factors, and I, I think that they are the right five factors. The middle school one was a little new to me. Uh, the other ones were all things I've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about. In terms of student economic disadvantage, you all know there's been a ton of research supporting that. Um, again, our weight that we've used for years doesn't even come close to the, the impact that national studies have shown on poverty. Um, you can take and look, plot test scores, whether the SBAC test scores or NAEP or whatever, and plot, plot them around poverty lines. It's unbelievable. It's like a straight line. It's crazy. Um, you know, Bill Mathis said this many years ago when he was still superintendent. You can, you can predict the success of schools in general just by looking at the financial package of the, of the parents that they have and the poverty that they live in, which is sad. We want to get to the point where a zip code is not a destination for a kid in terms of how successful they're going to be in life. Right. So how do we provide enough early intervention support? And to go back to Bill Mathis and Act 46, the state board, that was one of their big motivators yeah. was socioeconomic integration. Right. By a larger district. Stowe Sto and Morrisville being together. That, yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, ELL students, um, don't need to spend a lot of time talking about them, but 
keep in mind two things about ELL students. First of all, when they when a student comes in who can speak fluently in another language and is is uh, very successful in his or her own home language, they tend to learn English and learn a, a lot quicker in, in science and math than a student who comes in that may not be literate in their own language. We have plenty of kids that come in that are not literate in their own language. I can remember being a principal in South Burlington and having a boy and a girl. Uh, the girl was in at my middle school at Tuttle and the, and the boy was at uh, the high school in South Burlington. Pat Burke and I were jogging one day and I said, how's this family doing for you? And, he, and I, I, said, this, I said, our girl's really struggling. She's really, really struggling. We're giving her lots of support. And he goes, oh, the boy will probably be our valedictorian. I said, what are you talking about? The boy had gone to school. The girl had never been in school before. And that was a situation in that country where in that region where the girls didn't go to school. So if a kid comes in already, you know, deficit in their own language, it's so much harder to help them become English language learners. So that's why resources are important there. Middle and secondary, I think you realize that's a lot to do with licensing. You know, you need to have somebody who has an appropriate license to teach social studies or a higher level sciences and stuff. So that tends to drive the cost up. You may need four teachers instead of one teacher who's an expert elementary that can teach four or five content areas in the first grade. So there's, that's the cost that's there. Geographically necessary schools, I think that the legislature needs to spend some time on defining what that actually will look like and making sure that it really is geographically necessary. We need to consider Act 46, uh, declining enrollment, uh, increasing expectations that are put on schools, our substandard facilities, you know, school construction bill, all those things together, looking at it in a, in a real coherent package. And then our population density, um, as I say here, more dense populations and have better resources, and that's a fact. Um, if you're, if you have a lot of poverty and you live in, I'll use your your system, Senator, if you don't mind. If you live in St. Albans City, you're a lot closer to resources than you are if you live in Richford, which is in the same county. Richford is a huge transportation barrier to get to where most of the services are, which happen to be in St. Albans. If you're in St. Albans City, at least you're close to the services, you're more likely to get those, which is the reason why uh, population density is something that. Mm -hmm. I think is worth considering factoring in. Uh, and then uh, also I mentioned here, hopefully the population density can allow us to move to a more reliable metric, get away from the small schools grant the system we have right now. Connection to Act 173. Um, so I, I read the Secretary's testimony, it's very short. Um, on the first part, he talks about the uh, around the weights, and I think I agree with him that the weights should be without students with disabilities counted. And the reason for that is if we're gonna stick with the census-based model that 173 proposes, I think that's gonna be more consistent. I have not come to a conclusion on the second part of his testimony. On the first part, though, I do agree with him. Um, I think the legislature itself needs to understand the detail of the weighting study and what the implementation is gonna look like across the state, what the impact might be. I think. My suggestion, as I say here, is the study commission a sign that it's really given the necessary resources to study the report in detail and come back with hard recommendations to the legislature by a certain date, date certain. Maybe it's October, maybe it's November 1st. Um, and then they give recommendations and the hope would be that in the beginning of the next biennium, you folks would have a bill that could be implemented, that could be part of the budgeting process as you went forward into fiscal year 22. That, that would be yeah. my thought. And, and I, you're not the only person, I think, who, um, who might suggest the study committee. I guess my feeling about it is we, we pay a quarter of a million dollars for this study. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems to me to be very rigorous. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what a study committee would do in terms of implementation other than either to change the way or to think of some method of phasing them in. Well, phase in is certainly a conversation that, that some people have brought up, as have some of my yeah. members. Some of my members are writing me letters saying, this needs to happen yesterday, Yep. Yeah, obviously, because it's the winners and losers side. And there's some that are saying, we need to phase this, phase this in over a decade, in on everywhere in between. Uh, I'm just wondering how you're gonna get to the understanding so that everybody in this building mm -hmm. has enough understanding what this really means mm -hmm. before you go to votes votes on it as a well, and and. I guess just to play devil's advocate, yeah. the, the report. It's a great report, by the way. It's, a, it's an amazing report, and, and one of the more amazing aspects of it is it comes with very detailed simulations. Yeah. So in terms of understanding, it takes about a half an hour for someone to look through the executive summary and the 
simulations of their county or their district and figure out the impact on their voters. Um, again, unless the intention is for a study committee to, to change the numbers and create new simulations, which then I feel like we're going back down the road to where you started, which is that the weights that they stand now were political decisions that right. were not. Um, the, the current weights. Yes. They were not empirically derived. It's right. like, what do we think? Right. Um, so, but I, I don't want to dismiss what you're saying. No. I, I, I think there's a, an argument to be made that, um, and I believe in the House, it probably is the current state of play. They, they're they um, more standoffish toward the study itself, and I think would like to study the study or delay the study. So let me push back on one thing you said, if you don't yeah. mind, and that is the point you made around people looking at their, their own towns yes. and voting that way. I think the, the key is to get everybody to, and I don't know if you can do this, get everybody to really understand that we are in a state funding system. Yeah. And so instead of looking at their own towns, and it's hard, and your own town voters are the people that elect you, we need to be looking at it statewide. What is this going to do statewide? How, how do we start thinking about all children as all of our children, which was one of the, part of the promise of of Act 46, and part of the promise of Brigham, and part of the promise of the, the last Supreme Court case was to realize that public education is the responsibility of the whole state, and we're only as strong as our weakest link. If we're not providing resources necessary for poorer towns, poorer schools, poorer communities, then we all lose in the end. It hurts us economically, it hurts us socially. Um, I just I thank you for your testimony, and um, I have spent you know a fair amount of time on the waiting study, and I also have fair a, a good understanding of fiscal finance because I have a background in it. Mm -hmm. And I agree, even though I think this is something we should move forward with because I understand the implications of the big picture and the formula, et cetera. I am concerned about the lack of, of complete, uh, not, not even complete, a lack of understanding of what this, the implications of a change this major to our school funding formula is. Even if I believe it is the right thing to do, and you know, you look at my districts, and they're they're not they're not big losers, but they're they are in the sort of loser column. But I still think it's the right thing to do because of the big picture, and I am concerned about moving ahead with such a major change in our school funding formula without a larger understanding of the building. I don't really know if a study committee is the right thing. I don't think we should go back and rehash this because yeah. it's an excellent study. Yeah. Tammy did a great job. And it's more about how do you implement. It's how do you implement it and how do you get people to understand and buy in because the last thing we want is to have the scenario where we do this and then districts freak out all over the state and try to get out of it and all this stuff. We have a lot enough upheaval in our K-12 system right now. I don't want to create more upheaval. So, you know, I've been trying to figure out how we how we thoughtfully move forward with this. So I appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Jeff. Is that your directory? Jeff. Jeff. Is that your the director? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Francis. I'm the executive director of the School Superintendent Association. Um, I had an eye exam at 11:40, and and, I, and and you know, as I was leaving the office, I was like, "Where are those glasses that they give you so that you can actually see when you go outside?" So it took me 40 minutes to get back to my office, um, which should be normally a 10-minute walk. That, that's a joke, but I was like, pretty disoriented. So when I got back there, I was I was putting my testimony through a final check. <laughs> I'm not sure how effective a check it was, but I wanted to let you know if I seem a little bit disoriented, more than normal, that's why. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is that I think some folks think that the associations that are located at 2 Prospect Street are tighter in our coordination of testimony than we often actually are. Jay's testimony and my testimony are eerily similar, and we only spoke about it one time in very general terms. Um, but I think that I tried to go into a fair amount of detail with regard to how the Superintendents Association, how superintendents consider the 
implications and the magnitude of the waiting study. So what I've endeavored to do in order to be succinct is uh, organize my thoughts in an outline that I'm going to run through with you. I've provided Jeannie with a copy of it, and I have hard copies as well. The other thing that I've done is I've brought a letter that you've received but perhaps didn't study, which is from the superintendents in the Northeast Kingdom. It's a letter with a letterhead on it called the Vermont Rural Education Collaborative. Um, as a class, the superintendents and school districts in that region, um, there are 44 schools up there, are eager to see the waiting study implemented because they think that they've been historically disadvantaged. And I think that's an important point. In order to prepare my testimony, I did an outline, a rough outline that I shared with the officers of our association. We have five. And then I spoke with John Castle up in North Country Supervisory Union because he's a leader in the Rural Education Collaborative and has got a real interest in equity and the manifestation of our funding formula in terms of poverty implications and so on and so forth. Um, before I hit the outline, um, I want to also just indicate that I'm not sure that there were others who were engaged in public education for the implementation of Act 60, but I was. It was my first year on the job at VSA. And what I recall was that in the wake of the Brigham decision, the legislation that became Act um, 60 was heavily discussed in this building. And it was sold on two principal factors. One was equal educational opportunity, and one was reduction in tax rates in a bunch of communities, because that was the effect of Act 60. And that was a situation where I think you could apply the adage, where you stand depended on where you sat, because people both voted on that law on the basis of either of those two pictures, but they also explained it in their communities to voters on that same basis. So when John Nelson, Sue Siglowski's predecessor, I think four times removed, and I traveled across the state of Vermont in 1997, talking with school board members and school administrators about the implementation of Act 60, what we often heard if we emphasized equal educational opportunity was we thought we were going to save money in our taxes. And when we talked about tax rate savings, what we sometimes heard was we thought that this was going to enable a more equitable investment of resources in the education delivery system. So here we are now, 23 years later, and we've got what I think is one of the major implications of our education funding system as we consider what the manifestations are of the, of the waiting study. So when I think about this, I cannot help but think about that. Um, and some of that theme will play out as I talk about how I think we should be considering the waiting study. Um, so my first point is that the report is an expert analysis of Vermont's existing waiting system and related recommendations. Well, you might say that goes without saying. I was impressed with Tammy Colby's work. I also noted that she had the support of Bruce Baker from Rutgers, who's one of the foremost education finance experts in the country. So when I read that study, I got only through the um, executive summary, and I said there is an immense amount of value here. And that, that was at the executive summary level. And then as you go through the report, you realize that, and this is not always the case, one would hope that it would be, but in this particular instance, I think the state got its money's worth. That was the first point. The second point that I want to make is that the report is not a law or a court decision. So unlike the Brigham case and decision, which for all intents and purposes compelled the state to act with Act 60, here you've got a body of information which I believe should be acted on, but there's in effect no mandate to act on it. And when you listen to people now 20 years post um, Act 60 and Act 68, talk about that study as though it has the force of law or court decision, that's understandable based on their experience, but it does not have the force of law um, or, 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 or a court decision. 
despite that, my belief, and I think it, I think most people would regard this as um, indisputable or irrefutable. The, re the report provides strong evidence to change that changes to the Vermont waiting system within the education funding system are necessary to achieve a more equitable funding system. In fact, it is a call to action. So you've got the information you need there, in my opinion, to, um, to uh, work with your colleagues to um, put into effect those weights. And I think it's a matter of how you do that. And I'm gonna speak about that in a minute. But before I do, I want to um, touch upon something that both Jay spoke to and that Senator Hardy reiterated. The weights in our education funding system are but just one component in a complicated endeavor at a point in history where things have grown increasingly complex over time. So when I think about that, what I've written is that there are an abundance of policy issues that also should be considered in a review or evaluation of the funding system. They include, but are not, not limited to, implications from the moratorium on school construction aid, the growing need for investment in our buildings and education delivery system, the evolution of newly unified systems as they work to deliver more equity and efficiency over time, continuing declines in enrollment in many districts, the transition to Act 173 itself, implications of merging district tax rate transitions, so the mergers are still a recent um, event and communities are grappling um, with tax rate changes that exist under the current law, even without adjustments to the weight. The policy practice and management levers that are recommended or being applied by the Agency of Education, like a statewide accounting system, statewide data system, et cetera. Now, I would not sit here and say that the system overall is in flux, but I would say that it is challenged and to, for example, just change the weights without consideration for unintended consequences, ripple effects, um, uh, events or activities or findings or behavior that plays out in individual districts is something that I think needs to be contemplated. With all of that as a backdrop, I would still say that the need to evaluate these factors should not impede action. And what I mean by that is I think that the, way, the weights in and, of that sound, in and of themselves are compelling. And despite the fact that as a person who works with school districts day in and day out on the implementation of all these things, the reference to those things is not intended to be a barrier or an excuse or a recommendation that you don't act to the contrary. And I can elaborate on that if you have questions about it. My fifth point is, as modeled in various simulations, there will be some dramatic changes in equalized pupils, education spending per pupil, and associated tax rates. That is to be expected. But the implications of those changes should be considered and understood to the extent possible before the changes are made. This consideration is not intended to discourage or prevent the recommended changes. Districts will need support in communicating with their communities about inevitable changes. And I'm gonna just give you an example. So when I sent the outline of my testimony to the officers of uh, my association, I heard back from four out of five. Um, so Jean Collins from the Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union and um, uh, David Younts from the uh, Mill River Unified Union School District, they thought that I had hit critical points. Elaine Pinckney also thought, she's Champlain Valley School District, she also thought that I hit the critical points, but she pointed out to me that if you take the FY 2018 modeling, that the implications for Champlain Valley School District in real dollar terms are $15 million on a $75 million base. So it's 20% of their current operating budget. 
people might say, well, they've enjoyed the benefit of weights that have pointed in their favor over the last two decades. And I think that that may be indisputable. But when you think about the manifestation of a potential change like that, it could play out in a wide array of ways. It could play out in a, in a way that had them cut that money, or it could play out in a way that had them continue to spend that money, albeit at a higher tax rate. It's a pretty clear illustration of the fact that you've, this is not something that you should go into lightly, and I'll say now for the fourth time, but it is something that we should go into. Um, when I heard from Tracy Rand in Lamoille South Supervisory Union, uh, who's very thoughtful, she sent me back an email, four par paragraphs long, the emphasis of which was the challenges in the transition in Lamoille South Supervisory Union and the fact that Morrisville and Peoples and Elmore, which would have been advantaged if they were a standalone district, now would be disadvantaged in the aggregation of the tax rate with the Stowe School District. Mm -hmm. And if you're following what's happening in Lamoille South and some of the controversy that has ar arisen, both attributable to Act 46 and otherwise, that's not something that I would put those communities through without giving them a real clear understanding of what was happening and why. Um, so those were the points. I had five. My sixth point was when taken together, three, four, and five above present a compelling case for deliberate, well-informed, and timely action by the General Assembly. And I picked those three words for a reason. Mm -hmm. Deliberate, because it needs to be intentional and purposeful and without delay. Well-informed means there's a lot that needs to be consumed and disseminated in terms of the implications of this. Um, and timely means I think that the study was so well developed and so clear in terms of Vermont and how to gauge and measure Vermont against a wide array of criteria both in terms of what the academic science would say and what we know about experiences in other states. I, I think, and when I talk about an approach and other considerations, you know, I wouldn't use the term uh, a lawsuit waiting to happen so as not to create a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. but I think that's something that people ought to be thinking about. So I just contradicted myself, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so, so then, after I sort of went through that in my own mind and conferred with other folks, including um, uh, John Castle, who I already made reference to, and Tammy Colby herself, um, I devised an approach. And I was glad that Jay's and my testimony was similar, because I also have a commission of sorts. But I'm not going to call it a study commission. I refer to it as a commission on implementing the recommended weighting changes. And there may be some subtle difference in terms of how you would interpret that. But I will tell you, as an approach, this is something you might consider. Um, and because of the, re re because of the reaction um, Jay get, got and otherwise, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's a recommendation. It's, a, it's an explanation of one thing you might do. Um, so the first thing would be to develop a statement of legislative intent indicating the need and expectation for action on the weighting study recommendations. And I think several of you have articulated why you would want to act on it, as have I. So I think there's plenty of findings available. Um, the second would be to create a commission on implementing the recommended weighting changes and related matters. And the related matters would extend into some of those other policy considerations that people ought to be thinking about, if not addressing. The third thing would be charges to the commission. And um, this is where I got more specific. So the first one would be provide briefings on the rationale for and anticipated effects of the weighting changes for every member of the General Assembly. So make sure that 180 legislators know what's happening and why. And I'm going to cite an example as to why I think that's imperative. The Ways and Means Committee upstairs is pretty sophisticated in terms of ed finance taxation and, by extension, what happens in school district processes across Vermont. So one of the representatives up there had read the study 
And when Dan French um, or Tammy Colby, I can't recall which, I think it was, well, a witness, I will say, um, concluded their testimony, this particular representative said, I note that in the school district where I'm from, the uh, tax rate increase associated with these weight adjustments is 40 cents. So fair point, his eye was drawn to that tax rate change. He wasn't necessarily thinking about what the, all the implications would be. And I think based on people's human inclination to want to measure things in dollars and cents, you could probably garner a fair amount of support for a change to the weights among a number of legislators in this building simply by referring them to the simulation. Because if you look at the simulation, and I've been talking 2018, I haven't had a chance to study 2020 yet, but 2018 there's a lot of, you know, five to 20 cent variabilities in terms of taxes coming down and a bunch of 40 to 50 cent variability in terms of tax rates going up. So I haven't plotted it or mapped it or even looked at the spreadsheet in terms of pluses and minuses, but it's not 50% benefit and 50% don't. It tilts more heavily toward the benef beneficiaries. So that's, that's important for a couple of reasons. One, because you could probably gain political support outside of a more um, thorough analysis. Um, but also, the expectation should not be that your community is going to save 15 cents in the tax rate because the whole premise of the weights is you're going to have money to invest to make the delivery of education more equitable, which is a reason why information about what this is and what it's supposed to achieve is so important. Um, so briefings on the rationale and anticipated effects of the weighting changes for every member of the General Assembly. Remember, this is the potential charge to the Commission. Two, engaging expert analysis and understanding potential interplay between weights, the funding system overall, Act 173 delivery, school construction aid, factors of rurality, poverty, English language learners, mental health, and related obligations for schools. So I agree with you, Senator Baruth, that the study does a great job in explaining the weights, but it doesn't do, doesn't pay a lot of attention to what to do with the resources that are now kind of become available to you. And you might say, school officials ought to know that already, or you might say we're gonna leave that to local control. I think you, I'm not saying that you would, but you might, both of those are challengeable points. Because the way education is delivered right now, there's a fair amount of pressure in some communities to reduce costs irrespective of need. And if you needed evidence of that, you would only have had to go to the um, two hours of testimony on school construction yesterday where a lot of people talked about deficiencies in their school buildings, which is one marker. And they were asked, you know, how did it get to this point? And the response was, well, school board members, voters, and school administrators were making decisions to disinvest in their buildings in favor of what they construed to be other priorities. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated picture. And I'm not saying that we ought to create a four-year college program and force every legislator to go through it but it would be useful to have somebody talk to school officials and legislators alike about what this is, what opportunities it creates, and how to turn into those opportunities. Um, the third thing that the commission might do, um, and this, you know, you might, I may get quizzical looks um, to this one, support the education associations in providing consistent information on opportunities and budget implications of the weighting changes. Now here's what I mean by that. We'll have a conversation in this committee about an important piece of legislation and then we'll break. And, and the explanation of what happened and why starts to go through filters. Goes through my filter when I talk to superintendents, goes through Jay's filter, goes through each of your filters in terms of cons, uh, constituents. 
to the extent that we had a uniform body of information that would be conveyed to legislators and local school officials in relatively similar forms would be of tremendous benefit, I think. And then the fourth thing is, um, and this is key, convene the commission in as many sessions as necessary between enactment and October 15, 2020, in order to produce a hard recommendation on enactment for immediate application or transition, i.e. phase in, to inform both the process of school district, to inform both the process of school district budget development for FY 2022. So I've now discovered a, something that I would have corrected had I been able to read this when I got back to my office. <laughs> um, so there's a typo in that line. But the point is, I think that if the General Assembly does not act to enact those weights in this session, that you need to come back ready to do it in the in the in the first half of the next biennium um and yeah, to the to, if to I yeah, just yeah ask you what you would think of this so um so i hear two um you know uh, a little cognitive dissonance where you're you're saying we we should act yeah um but also we should um <clears throat> prepare carefully so it is it is possible to act this year on a bill that puts out a schedule of things to happen yep. Act 173. So what would you think about instead of a commission being impaneled, getting up to speed, et cetera, and then them figuring out how to go around the state, what if we assign to the state board uh, a year of public outreach where they would convey the same message around the state um, and then, I think this is just a thought experiment on the timing, but we're already too late for the current budget year. So for the next year, they are rolling that out, explaining that. Then the following year, the first half of the phasing kicks in, and the year following, the second half of the phasing. So you'd have a three-year process that we would theoretically put in a bill in green light this year, but that would roll forward on a three-year timeline. Um, what would you think about that in terms of your two counter So I would say a couple things. One is um, mine was just one approach, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to apply alliteration. I think it's alliteration. Fundamentally, form follows function. So I think you could do it a multitude of ways. I think you need to decide what it is you want to do. And I think my points about education, understanding, um, uh, General Assembly should think about how it is they want to do this. If the state board was involved, I would say, because that was the example you cited, they need access to expertise that they currently do not have access to. Um, but provided expertise, and I would say that the interests on this are so shared Mm -hmm. that the General Assembly should weigh in heavily on what type of expertise they would want them to have. I, we could, you know, in the way that we did with Act 46, there was a mandated interplay between AOE and the board. Right. And essentially AOE developed the map. Right. And then the state board went around with that map, did public hearings of their own, yeah. made, made changes without having to have their own staff. Sure. So um, I just throw that out there as a way of saying, you know, I, I suppose what I, what I don't like about the idea of creating another task force or another commission is that in a sense it redoes the step that we've already done, which is, you know, we, we had the most authoritative study done. Yeah. They presented us with a series of simulations and models, and it seems like I, I definitely take the point about preparing yeah. the, the, you know, the different constituencies for what will happen if we pass a bill. Right. And I think that's good to build in. Um, I just, I feel like if we panel a commission or a study committee or a task force, what we will wind up with is what we have on our desks right now, yeah. which is these are the weights 
you can choose to do it at once or over a series of steps. Um, are they really going to be able to do very much in terms of the, the interplay between school construction and Act 173 in the weights? Probably not, because they won't be policy makers. Um, they'll be in an advisory group. Yeah. Um, so that, I, that's a point well taken. And I, again, you know, I, um, I, I think that uh, my main point is the context, education, and careful planning that mm -hmm. people need to have as a basis to move forward on this. Yeah. And, but I, I have not, um, uh, you know, I'm not wedded to any particular idea. Mm -hmm. I, I will always weigh in on whether I think an idea is gonna be effective or not based on my own experience. Mm -hmm. But I think that the suggestion you make is, uh, has merit. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just a matter of not leaving people, um, both in the General Assembly and in the field, uh, thinking that this is something that it's not, and also understanding why the weights would be adjusted in the first place, and that it's sort of a more complicated matter, what they could do to take advantage of the change, or mm -hmm. if they're going to get more opportunity and how to contend with it if they're going to have less monetary access as it were but of course with our education funding system they would never have less monetary access it's just a question of what they want to tax themselves right. okay right. so let me i'll go very briefly through the rest because i know that um i appreciate the time you've given me so far so then i had um so i didn't anticipate your question precisely but i also included a note if you thought that you were under pressure to act immediately, I think it's within the realm of possibility that you could do some partial weighting adjustments, which you might have referred to as a phased approach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I don't know what the what you know potential plaintiffs might tolerate, but when I talked with some folks who have a real interest in seeing action on this as soon as they can, what I heard from them was they had a, they, they have an interest in making sure that the study will get acted on and with a predictable timeline. So the other considerations that I will run through rapidly is one, I think there's a need, potential need to consider Act 173 funding timelines in the context of all of this. Two. The equalized pupils are baked in. Right, Yeah. right. Two, um, how to contend, and some of these things I've touched on, but these were important points that I wanted to pull back out. How to contend with the potential that increased spending capacity won't translate or will translate uh, to increased investment in the areas associated with the respective weights and how to measure that over time. Like, will people use the capacity for rurality um, or English language learners or children with special needs in the way they should? Um, three, how do you best inform po the policy making process in a manner that has decision makers, both state and local, understanding the purpose of the changes to the weighting system with an emphasis on using that understanding to better apply the, those changes? So you'll see my reputation for re redundancy stays with me because that's a point that I made. Um, four, how to support or not the implications of the increase or decrease in access to resources associated with the weighting change. I've talked about that ad nauseum. Um, need to give due consideration to geographic sparsity. So one of the things that we know with our um, relatively dramatic declines in enrollment are there are schools where people are uh, asserting viability and necessity when they're in proximity to places that have capacity and that's a big policy question. Um, and it's one that the legislature has largely stayed out of. But if you want to get your best dollar value moving forward, that's something you might have to tackle. Or the state board might need to tackle. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, is a contingency necessary in case a lawsuit is brought? And what I mean by that is you could have a beautiful legislative plan that extends over three years, and then all of a sudden, somebody utilizes that study in their own experience and goes to court and you need a plan B. Yeah. Um, so that's not anything that I have the answer to, but it's something that occurred to me when I was thinking about this. And, and uh, I've thought about the possibility of a lawsuit too, especially in that these figures are 
as I said before, empirically derived. So it, I, I think it would be persuasive in the court of law to say we're, we're being underfunded. The legislature knows we're being underfunded. You need to compel them. But it seems to me if the legislature were to act this year in the best case scenario, if it's stretched over a number of years, it's still, we are still in the process of acting on it and producing a timeline that has a very finite implementation. So I have a hard time feeling like a court would find three years to be too long. Right. Um, I, I think in, in the glacial pace of these things, that's pretty quick. Right, and, I, and that, is a, as I talked about this with a few people, they had a comment very similar to yours. Okay. Um, I, I, I brought the letter that you have, but I told John Castle that I'd deliver it to you. He would like to testify as you extend these comments. He was in, and we, okay. he and I had a conversation about it. I, I believe everybody on the committee got the letter. Okay. Can you pass those around? So that, oh, that concludes my testimony. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so my understanding, the goal of this, and, and I, I know we use words like equity and other things, but ultimately what, I, what I'm calculating, or what's throughout in my mind, is that we're saying that there's not enough money in the system as a state, and we need to redo this weighting so that these districts have more passing capacity to bring those dollars into get to an equitable level, right? No. I don't think because there's because nothing said, in that report that says there's not enough money. But when in the we state. talk, when you say, well, we hope people don't use the extra taxing capacity that they have to get tax breaks, we hope that they use that to reinvest. It's saying we're going to flood the system with more money from those areas. That, that's not what I say. Well, the, the, but that's where we're getting to. Right? So well, if you said to me, do we, I mean, uh, if you asked me the question, Jeffrey Francis, do you believe we have enough money in the system? My response to that is yes. Do I feel like the needs that are reflected in the waiting study are accounted for properly in the current education funding system, the answer to that question is no. And, so, and this you think will fix it? You know, Potential. yeah, I mean, that, that's, goes, I'll answer the question, yeah. but it's not me. It's, it's, the, it's the people that did the study and, and it's your evaluation, but you know, I'll go out on a limb and say, I would not want to be on the other side arguing that that study didn't have merit and didn't make sense. No, Nor I, I get it, but what I think is going to happen to this, in my longer term concern, is it's going to blow school budgets completely up even more in the time, and we're going to not have the tough discussions we need to have in our communities across the state about getting spending in line. When you we have two billion dollars, or you know, when you add in teacher pension obligations and all that. I yeah. think we're better off talking about how do we reimagine the whole system on how we spend that money. So I, I would refer you to my discussion point number four, which is you and I said it. I said it in a, in a different way than you have said it, but um, and, and we'll each have perspective on it. Yours is a very legitimate perspective, um, but you're pretty far distance from, for example, capping per pupil expenditures which would be one approach that's been taken and attempted, taken in some states and attempted in others. The, this waiting study is a pretty far distance from that type of a philosophy. So if what I would say, you know, just now as an observer of public process, if the intentions of the General Assembly are to get a handle on costs and somehow suppress or control costs, that's not what this is. Um, and I'll, I, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the whole school construction issue because we've been spending a fair amount of time on that. And a statistic that Mark Peral brought to the House Education Committee um, recently that would cause one to wonder whether we've been putting our money in the right place without you know, making accusations or casting aspersions is that we're in the top five in terms of head spending per pupil, and we're in the bottom five in terms of capital construction investment, all right? Now, what I would say parenthetically to that is throughout the conversations about Act 46, one of the principles was that if you created larger units of management, 
you could get a handle, better handle on ratios. So we've also got the lowest ratios in the country. So, you know, if you're looking for somebody to come in here and sort of defend the status quo, I'm not going to do it. What I'm doing is trying to give you my best thinking with regard to where you are today. Yeah. And we were asked to testify in the waiting study. I, I think while we're having this discussion, if we don't have the discussion on caps, property tax will continue to draw out of control and people aren't going to be able to. Yeah, that's for the six of you to talk about. No, I know, but I, I think not having that discussion with this discussion will be another missed opportunity, another half a decade of rising property taxes. Okay, well, I mean, that's what the, that's, you're the deliberative body, 30 senators. Um, well, I think Corey's quite, well, thank you for your testimony. Um, I think uh, I agree with you on almost all of your points. Um, and I think Corey's question actually illustrates why, what I've been grappling with um, in terms of how do we help our, our own colleagues understand this um, and the implications of it. And I, I think I, I appreciated that you brought in other things that could be and probably should be considered in the study school construction, how do, how do districts who are quote unquote winners spend the money? Um, how do districts who are quote unquote losers deal with, the, deal with their, you know, that $15 million budget implication? I, I think that there's a lot that we have to take into account in making a change this big. And I, I appreciate that you want to do it in a phased in approach. And I think that Potentially, the State Board of Education is is a body that could be helpful. I do think that it needs to include people in this building, though, because I think that we, you know, if I'm going to go back and talk to my school districts and my constituents and and my superintendents and school boards about this, I, I have the tools to be able to do that, and most of us don't. And I want to be able to make sure that we all have the tools that we need to have these conversations. So you can explain it to your constituents and the implications. And, and I think we should be putting in there some things if you are getting increased tax um, funding capacity, these are the things you should be spending it on because these are the things that are gonna help students in poverty or ELL or rural students and, and, and making some policy decisions about that type of thing. And then potentially making some policy decisions about you know the other end of it too, spending caps not going to go there, but um, but I, I just think the implications and, and then the 173 implications are, are huge. And just if I can say one last thing, yeah. to Senator Parent's point, so on the day this broke, Mark Peralt and I had a conversation, and we both, we asked, a, it was a rhetorical question, what happens if the places who see their taxes increase as a result of weight adjustments continue to spend at the same level? And if you look at the characteristics of those places, that's within the realm of possibility. I mean, I cited the Champlain Valley School District, which has got an evolved system that it has heavy investment. And I think that if they had tax rate effects associated with changes in weights, then one might speculate that their spending would not drop at the level commensurate. But, but and if the places that have capacity because they want to invest at, you know, in um, students of poverty more than they've been able to, if they make those investments, then the potential does exist for costs to increase. That's what our system is. The budgets that get approved get funded. So I'm not going to argue your point. I'm just going to tell you that I'm not going to take responsibility for the report or the current no, no, circumstance. No, no, no. But I, just, I, I think. I think that it's going to be an inflationary push. You know, and I, I look at you know my district, the one that get, the ones that get hit the hardest have been the most responsible. I've got one community, Fairfax. They just voted down another school that you, you know, they're one of the hardest. It's communities here, it's the town of Georgia, hit a fifty-two cent tax rate. You know, they're but they're pure people spending right now is thirteen thousand right. dollars. You know, they're, yeah. they're those are big issues that they're going to have to grapple with, and they've acted responsibly. From a Franklin County perspective, of spending their dollars wisely, and and well, that, that we're gonna have to go home. And like Bruce said, we're all gonna have to explain whether I vote, we vote for this or not, and it does pass. We still have to explain to our constituents what it means for them. And you know, just to point up the realities ideologically of, I want to call it the two parties, but of yes voters and no voters statewide. I think no voters on school budgets, whether they're 
board members or whether they're parents, taxpayers, whatever, they're going to view, if they have extra capacity, they're going to view it as their right to drop their tax rate because they've been underfunded, so overtaxed, over the years, historically. So I don't think you're going to win an argument with those people that they have a right to do that. Similarly, in communities where they really believe in laying on uh, the services that they, that they need for these populations, I don't think you're going to be able to persuade them either. So, you know, we're going to be in the same world if we change the funding formula. And some people are going to insist on dropping their tax rates, and some people are going to insist on raising them. But what's, our, what's the overall? I, I the problem I always have with that funding is it's the classic case of the tragedy of the commons. The way we do fund it, it's a prisoner dilemma game theory. You have no incentive to vote your budget down because of the overall impact of the state thinks so we've driven them up over the last 20 years. But, but, but this, do doesn't, this doesn't, imp I don't think, fix it. And I think the, the discussion I think Vermonters really want us to have is how do we get costs under control. But No, and, and I agree. There's, a, there's an overall argument to be had that if we scrap the whole system and put something in that's simpler and fair, it would like it better, but it's just like the healthcare system. You can, you right. can say, um, as you know, the Democratic primaries, Medicare for all. Um, once you get into the details, it breeds its own complexity, and then you're sort of back in the same universe. Of how do you, how do you uh, provide a universal benefit when some people seem to be getting hit harder? And and I think that conversation that Vermonters really want us to have is how do we provide an equitable, edu equitable education across our entire state to all of our kids. Mm -hmm. And that's what this study does. It's a great vehicle for doing that. Yeah. Um, what I'm concerned about is making sure that we all understand the implications and taking advantage of a change this big to make other policy changes and, mm -hmm. and, and, and really dig into some of these other things, which given this time in the session, it may be hard to do. Yeah. Laying the groundwork for doing that, I think we should absolutely do mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm really, as a as a, a former a fiscal analyst on school finance, I'm really wary of a legislative body making decisions based on a, a spreadsheet that has winners and losers on it. <clears throat> because then we're all just looking at our districts and going, ah, I don't know, and then voting based on the spreadsheet rather than based on a full understanding of the policy implications. And, you know, as a le now a legislator, I want to understand what I'm voting on, and I want my colleagues to understand what they're voting on. And, and I, I take that point. I would, I would argue that usually it happens the reverse. So usually what would happen is there would be a, a recommendation that we change the rating formula, but there would be no simulations. And then everybody would, would be up in arms and try to get something over on. I think this study did us a huge favor by saying, look, here you go. It's, it's all out there. Now, because that's so transparent and easily digested one way or the other, we can spend the time on what you're talking about, which is the overall rationale. And I think that's where Jeff's going to yeah. Um, yeah. make it clear that there is a moral imperative, one that could turn into legal trouble for the state pretty easily. Um, Thank you. So, so we're up against a hard deadline of three, so I want to make sure that we have Jeff Bannon. Um, you have others you want to do? I'm around here. If you want to well, no. I, I, in other words, I want to complete this testimony. That's fine. It may mean that we're not going to get to the new draft on the statewide bargaining today. Um, how long do you think you got? I, I'll be brief, and, and here's why. Uh, Jeff and Jay did a nice job of summarizing. I will emphasize a few points here, if you don't mind. Um, Jeff, for the record, Jeff Bannon, Vermont and EA. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the waiting study. It is an impressive study. Uh, I think it should have uh, and is, is having an influence on your conversation here today and going forward. Um, I, somebody, I don't know if it was Jay or Jeff, uh, talked about opportunity for resources under Act 60 and 68. And, and this would adjust that. And the question that you're grappling with is how do you, um, I, I use this word perhaps inappropriately, but the, the thought I have is do you require schools to adjust for the waiting that they've been under supporting kids? Um, and do we, how do you address that? And that's, that's going to be something that you have to tackle, and, and I get it, and, uh, but it is important because 
some of these kids do have significant needs. Jay talked about the kids with trauma. That is what we see a lot. I've got uh, with me my uh, member from Springfield, Allison Sylvester, a fifth grade teacher, um, talking about, you know, Springfield is, is front and center and sees a lot of kids with trauma. Uh, and every day, multiple kids in each classroom. Um, and so they are struggling with that issue. And they, they could use those resources for social workers um, and other needs the kids have, to, to address other needs the kids have. They are arriving to kids, the kids are arriving to school, having spent the evening and the morning with parents who are not well regulated themselves. And so we're asking the kids to be re well regulated and that's not happening at home. They're not, they're not seen as a model uh, type of behavior. So that's, but we're asking a lot of the kids and therefore the teachers and support staff to work with those kids and we should. The waiting study, in fact, would give them resources to do that. Uh, and if they are all of our kids, as Jake mentioned or Jeff mentioned, um, we should think of it that way. And I, I very much do. Um, I'll speed up here a little bit. There was mention of Act 173. I can't emphasize it enough. <clears throat> if you're going to do this waiting study, we really, really, really need to look at Act 173 and its block grant funding. Um, I can come back and talk to you about Act 173 more, more in depth. But um, that is a big, huge change that is in the process of being rolled out. It's not yet rolled out, so we have time to sort of right that ship. But if you're going to make changes and changing levers all the time, I uh, work with a colleague who's a former science teacher, and he talks about changing one lever at a time and studying it, see what, how it works, um, and then adjusting thereafter. But we're switching a lot of levers, as Jeff mentioned, here all at once in the last several years. There is um, fatigue <coughs> about that out in the field. People talk about Act 173, have met with members around the state, and they, <coughs> they understand the numbers 1, 7, and 3, but they don't understand 173. And um, it is seismic. Throw on top of that Act 46, which is only about the governance, here we're talking about the kids. We're talking about waiting for kids. We're talking about how we fund services uh, and how we fund special ed in, under 173. So the combination could be toxic. And we are concerned about the erosion of public support for the public school system and changing. And so that's a legitimate concern on our part. No, and, and perfectly valid and one that I share. I guess what I would say is 173 is for me, the largest driver to implement this because the equalized pupils are, it's all about the, the formula, you know, the, the formula that we're developing for the census grant, which includes the equalized pupils. So if we were to wait until 173 had been implemented, let's say we, we said we're going to wait five years to implement this, we implement 173, we have implemented it with a flawed a, a formula that we now know will be substantially flawed because of the inequity built in the equalized pupil system. So then we would, five years out, having implemented a formula that we know to be inaccurate, then we would correct it five years out. So I guess what I'm trying to think of is, is there a way to, in advance of the full creation of the census grant formula, going to draw on the equalized pupils. Is there a way to get us to um, at least substantial phasing of that change so that we can, with a straight face, argue that the census grant formula when it's developed is accurate? <coughs> Does that make sense? I, I do. I think I understand it. Here's what I would say is the answer is yes, but I think you have to stop the implementation of 173. We're, yeah, you know, or delay it. Delay it. We are saying we are calling for repeal of 173. Just to be very honest with you, oh, I, I uh, yeah, we we haven't talked about it here, and, and, okay. and I'll mention it up in, in uh, repeal the repeal house. Repeal the entire they should be partly because they don't have enough hands. Um, I think so. So it's a good question for us for the rest of the session. Is there a way to spur professional development around Act 173 and also? Yeah, I mean, listening to the testimony yesterday about PB, PBGL, PBGRs yeah. or whatever, um, I think that's, it, it, you're spot on. Okay. PD is necessary for folks to, I mean, the culture is out there, and it is what it is, good or bad, 
um, but that's how people are practicing their day to day and teaching and educating kids. If you want to change it, and that may be a good and valid thing to do, it is going to take some significant efforts to change it. Nate Levinson testified in, from DMG, which is the report that prompted 173 in large measure, said that it was two to three years of intensive PD to change people and then ongoing regular PD thereafter. And so that is, um, it hasn't happened yet. And, I, and so I think if we're going to change the weights, and you may have some uh, legal and uh, analysis from ledge council that suggests that you might need to in some way or another, but um, maybe that's the, the, the thing that we should start with. Mm -hmm. We think the weights are, uh, the conversation is a good one. The report is very impressive. Um, and uh, some of the things that, that Jay and Jeff have said are true, that these weights need to be adjusted. They're from Act 60, and nobody knows where they came from. They just were what they were. Yeah, and I had already thought, um, you know, when you, Jim made a great timeline of Act 173 rollout, we had already moved it a year, but it, once this waiting study landed, I had already thought about the possibility that if we wanted to have the weights phased in before the, the uh, sort of terminal calculation of the census grant, then we might have to mess with the timeline. Um, so we'll, we'll hang that on the wall as something to be thinking about. was a five-year rollout, I think now is longer. It may need to be. Yeah. Can I, can I follow up there? Yeah, yeah. Act 173 doesn't use the correct term. It doesn't? No. It uses a three-year average of an eight-year So it's just a, a student count of okay. average students, average over three years. So, so not, e not equalized no, the only in any way. So in UVM's report on the waiting study, they said one of the recommendations one of the avenues you could pursue is rather than making an adjustment to the census grant for um, areas that need more support, uh, one of the solutions to that is rather increasing the, the grant amount using equalized peoples in the calculation because mm -hmm. it picks up all those, all those differences implicitly. Mm -hmm. so, but that's not in there now. It's yeah. just a way of, of adjusting that piece. Okay. I must have swapped it out for ADM in my AM. What is it using? Yeah. AM is average, it's average, it's average it's just yeah. a student count taken every year between like for a 10-day period um, of enrolled students. It's actually students in seats, not just it stands for average daily membership. 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 <laughs> Jeff, anyway. anything else? No. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. No, you're impressed. And, I appreciate all the testimony today. It was very, very useful and very thoughtful. Um, and we'll, we'll continue working along on it. I, I think everybody's watchword is um, making sure we don't make things worse. Um, and, and yet acting as fast as it is possible to do without, without a mistake. Um, so committee, we're, we're done, I think. I had hoped that Jim could put out the new draft for statewide public school employee health benefits, but um, I'm reluctant to have him just throw it out without a walkthrough. So we'll save that and take it up on Tuesday. It's all color coded. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you'll be um, under the whip hand of the vice <laughs> chair for Thursday and Friday. Anything before we break? Were we going to talk about PBL? No. Uh, not today. Oh, okay. we'll, we'll move that off until two days. Mm -hmm. Jim, can I talk to you before we run away? All right. See you. Tuesday. So I have a one. Yeah. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>